Hey everybody, this is Pastor James. Welcome back to our Bible study through the book of Judges. Today we're going to be in chapter 6 and we'll be beginning the story of Gideon. Before we jump into the text, let's open up with a word of prayer. God, please bless this time that we have together today. Let it be used to encourage us, to challenge us, and to make us more like you. We pray, Father, that you would forgive us for all the ways that we have fallen short of your glory, the ways that we have sinned against you. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us in the paths of truth. We pray, God, you'd make us useful for your kingdom. And we ask, God, that you just bless this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody, we're going through our book of Judges, and we are learning a whole lot about who God is and who we are. The people of Israel made their way into the promised land, and they were greeted by God's power as he dispossessed all of the nations that were currently living there. Joshua, their leader at the time, passed away, and there were still just a few places that they needed to root out the inhabitants of the land. They didn't do it. And as a result, God kept his promise. What was that promise, you ask? Well, he said, if you follow me and if you serve me with your whole heart um, and do what I command you, then I will go before you. I will grant you success and peace. I will dispossess your enemies. I will bless you. And if you do not do what I have commanded you to do, if you don't follow through with the work that I've entrusted to you, then I will not protect you. My hand of blessing will not be on you. And so the book of Judges is the story of God's people in their promised land with their God. And the big question is, is whether or not they will obey him. We find out very quickly that it is impossible for them to obey him. There's a lot of reasons for this. Our humanity and our sinfulness is one of them. But what they didn't do is they didn't complete the work that he had called them to complete, which is to put out the sinful nations that existed in the land. We, like them, tend to justify leaving sin in our life. And we don't realize the fact that that sinfulness breaks fellowship with us and it is catastrophically dangerous for future generations, especially when it comes to their knowledge of the Lord. And so the book of Judges has brought us through these times where Israel would disobey God. God's hand would come, up, come off them. They would cry out to God after a while. And God would raise up a deliverer, a judge, someone to free them from the oppression of the people around them that live around the nations that they live in. And now what we find today is that God is about to raise up a new judge. His name is Gideon. But before we get to Gideon, we get a new insight into the process of God's deliverance of his people. Up to this point in the book of Judges, all that is said is that these people, these Israelites, did what was wrong in God's eyes. And so a surrounding nation would come in and oppress them. Once they were oppressed, for whatever period of time that was, it would say that they called out to the Lord and God raised up a deliverer. And that's all we knew. That's a lot of uh, holes, as it were, in the story. But today we get to see a glimpse into maybe more of the day-to-day -day actions of their repentance, of God's blessing, um, their calls for help with his response. And it would be uh, what you would expect. God's not happy with them, and he lets them know through a prophet. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at what happens before Gideon is called. So in chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, we're going to cover his story, and then we're going to end up asking ourselves this question, why does it take us so long to turn to God from our sins? Why do we have to suffer so long before we'll call out to God? And we'll answer a few of those questions at the end, okay? So let's read together. Chapter 6, verse 1. Then the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian seven years. The power of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves the dens which are in the mountains and in the caves and the strongholds. 
For it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites would come up with the Amalekites and the sons of the east and go against them. So they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel, as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come in like locusts for number, but they and their camels were innumerable, and they came into the land to devastate it. So Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the sons of Israel cried to the Lord. Now it came about, when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord on account of Midian, that the Lord sent a prophet to the sons of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, It was I who brought you up out of Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all your oppressors and dispossessed them before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not obeyed me. Now the story is going to cut away after verse 10, and it's going to go on to the calling of Gideon. So with this preamble to the story, what we do is we learn about the setting in which Israel was being oppressed. Well, first of all, they were in the hands of a king from Midian. All right, we don't know the name of the king, but the king of Midian and the Amorites and all the sons of the east would come over during this period and oppress Israel. It does not say that they would go to war against Israel. It does not say that they enslaved Israel. The picture that it gives, in fact, is just a wicked oppression. They would come in on their camels. They would come in in battle array. And when the harvest or when the sowing time came during the year, when they went to plant their seeds, they would go in and destroy the land. I don't know at what point, maybe once the sprouts came up, it said they had an innumerable host of people and an innumerable amount of camels to go with them. So they came in like locusts, so thousands upon thousands upon the land. For those of you who don't know what locusts are, we've had a few uh, events with them over the last few years. You can get on YouTube and look at it if you want. But they'll come in by the millions and millions and millions of bugs flying in. And what they do is they cover a crop and they will literally eat the crop from the top to the root and the bottom in a matter of hours or days. Um, they just come in and destroy total fields of uh, food. And that's exactly what was happening here. What we see here is that Midian and the Amorites were trying to oppress Israel and keep them weak by taking away their um, their produce, really, their, all the stuff that they could trade. They didn't leave them oxen. They didn't leave them goats. They didn't leave them bulls. They just took everything. And so the people of Israel could not provide for themselves. Now, this took place across all of the nation of Israel. The Amorites and the Midianites, we know, live east of the River Jordan, and they were some of the first ones to come in and oppress the people of Israel in the early days of the judges. So these people have come back, and they, they took away the produce all the way down to Gaza. So Gaza is all the way over on the west side of Israel. So from east to west, they were stripped bare um, as these people came in. There was no room for them. And what did the Israelites do? It says, um, so in verse four, they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth. I'm sorry, par pardon me. In verse two, it says, the power of Midian prevailed against Israel because Midian, the sons of, because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves dens, which were in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. I believe this is a reference to the caves in which King David is going to later hide while Saul is pursuing him. There are a lot of the cave in Ed and Gedi, uh, the various wilderness strongholds that he would defend with his ruthless rapscallion men. These are the holes that they're hiding in that were made during this time. So the people of Israel, in order to avoid the Amorites, would literally hide in the mountains. And I don't mean just like they'd hike the mountain. They would dig holes in the mountains. They made caves in the mountains. They made tunnels. They made fortif fortifications so that if they had to fight them off, they could. And so these Israelites were severely oppressed. They were terrified of their afflictors and they were hopeless. 
The Bible tells us that this went on for seven years. Now, I don't know about you, but after one bad day, I'm ready to seek God's face and say, God, what in the world is going on? Why is my day stinking like this? But the Israelites, it took them seven years. And it wasn't just that their blessings had went away and it wasn't just that they were oppressed. But the problem is, and what happened to them, and what happens to us too, is they had already undermined their ability to turn to God. You see, them not turning to God was the problem in the first place. They had set up different idols to different gods of the people in whose land they lived, the gods of the Amorites. We're going to find out Gideon actually has to go do battle against those gods and their idols immediately before God will bless his uh, elevation to the position of a judge. And so what I want you to see here is that the Israelites could not turn to God yet because they were still turning to the Amorite gods. They had established their altars in the land. They were worshiping them for the produce of their land, for the rain to come. They had turned all of their attention to the, the false gods of the land, and that is why they were being oppressed in the first place. They had abandoned God a long time before this. And so when God oppressed them, it took them seven years to give up on their gods, their false gods, before they were willing to cry out to the one true God. Now, what we do is we get to see an uh, 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 we get to see a insight in this particular story that we haven't seen thus far in the Book of Judges. We get to see how God responds to His people when they call to Him. Well, in this particular case, He sends a prophet to them. He sends a prophet to them. And he actually has a, a message for them. He says in verse, um, in verse eight, it says, the Lord sent a prophet to the sons of Israel. And he said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, it was I who brought you out or up from Egypt. And I brought you out of the house of of slavery. I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians, from the hands of all your oppressors, and dispossessed them before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not obeyed me. You see, God comes to them. They cry out to him for rescue. They don't really know him. They don't really understand him. That's their own fault. It's their parents' fault. They didn't do the work that they should have done before. But God doesn't abandon them. Neither does he baby them. Because God's holiness has not changed. The sinfulness of the individuals over the course of time is what's caused this harsh punishment to come upon them. And their own hardness of heart is what's kept them in this punishment for seven years. And what's happened now is now that they've realized that these gods that they're trusting in can't save them, they turn to call to God, and now all of a sudden, God comes to them with a rebuke. He's, his testimony to them is one of obvious fact, but it's one that's been forgotten. He says, I'm the one who brought you up out of Egypt. You should have called to me a long time ago. I'm the one who dispossessed all the people in the land you're currently living. You should have called me a long time ago. When you got into this land, I commanded you to serve me with your whole heart, to not fear the gods of the Amorites because I had crushed them. And yet here we are today. You still fear them. And that's where the message gets cut off. We're left to wonder, what are the Israelites going to do? Is God going to even help them? The question at large is, what are the Israelites going to do to abandon the false gods that they've been worshiping and petition God to continue to act on their behalf? We're going to see a zoomed in version of this when Gideon gets called. In fact, the very first thing he's going to do is go to war against uh, the Asheroth and the Baal um, idols that are set up in his father's hometown. And we're also going to find out that Gideon 
may very well have heard this prophetic message preached because when the angel of the Lord appears to him in the next uh, couple of verses, he's going to say, what happened to the God of our fathers who supposedly delivered us? Where are his miracles? Where are his deliverances? And it's ironic because God's about to use him to do just such a thing. And what I want you to know tonight, brothers and sisters, what I want you to consider with me as we examine the first part of this lesson uh, this week is why does it take us so long to turn to God? Why does it take us so long to ask him to deliver us, whether it's to be saved from our sins, uh, to be at peace with God, or whether it is to be delivered out of physically oppressive circumstances here on earth? Well, the first reason, and maybe the most clear from our text, the reason we take so long to turn to God is because we already have gods that we're worshiping. And God has actually allowed the discipline and the pain to come into our life, the lack of deliverance to come into our life, so that we can recognize that they are false gods. They are dead gods. They cannot help us. You see, everything that's on this earth that delivers good to us comes through the hand of the one true living God. It comes to us through conduits that are not the source in themselves, but they are the ones that deliver it. They're like the UPS. They don't own the item, but they bring it to you. So the freedom that we have as Americans is delivered to us from God. It's not delivered to us from a president or from a military. The good abundance of, abundance of food that we have in our country is from God. It's not from hardworking farmers. Although far, farmers bring it to us, God causes the crops to grow. And what you need to understand is when we come into a food shortage, What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to start looking to the government to find out why don't we have food? Is it a logistics problem? Do we need to start hiring different people? Do we need to blame corporations? All of these false idols we trust in. And as the government uh, rolls out new agendas and new fixes, we wait patiently to see if they will meet our needs. And brothers and sisters, we have established a system of idols, a dependence upon false gods. We have depended on the created or the conduits rather than the creator or the giver. And brothers and sisters, one of the reasons it takes us so long to turn to God in repentance is because we have so many idols already set up in our life. We would rather go to them because we're already comfortable with them than we are to be totally dependent upon God. We often will have to come to the absolute end of our rope. The world will have to be burning around us before we will turn back to God and say, God, we need you. That is exactly why they say there are no atheists in a foxhole. When the bombs start shelling and the rounds start flying overhead, people very, really, very quickly realize their tank won't save them. The great communication systems won't save them. The vast number of their army will not save them in particular. No, they are at the mercy of God, and that is exactly who they call to. These Israelites who are holed up in caves are calling out to God in desperation, not because they so clearly love God, but because they have nowhere else to go. And so, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you today. Don't wait so long to turn to God. If you're hearing this message today, if you're hearing this prophetic word to you today, then what you need to understand is that God is there. God is your God, but you must turn from serving false gods and idols. You must stop trusting in, giving glory to, and worshiping other idols. Like Gideon, you're going to have to go in and do war with those things in order for God to have his hand of blessing upon you. God desires your un, uh, undivided worship. He will not allow his glory or his praise to go to another. You must worship him alone. And brothers and sisters, I know that's very difficult in our day and time today to understand. But God alone wants the glory and God alone deserves the glory. Everybody else, everybody else, everything else is just a stewardship of what God has given to us. And if you want to see our country return to former glory, if you want to see God's hand of blessing return upon our people, then the judgment of God must start in the house of God. He must come to us and tell us, look, you have not kept my word. You have served other gods. And what you need to do is do away with those things 
and I will come to you and I will rescue you. Now, in this particular passage, he doesn't mention anything about rescue, but it's only the beginning of the passage. He leaves those people to consider the fact that they have abandoned God and that now he's going to reveal himself personally to the Israelites' future deliverer in Gideon. And we're going to find out how he does that next week. But for now, what I want to do is I want to encourage each and every one of you to not wait to turn to God till the world's burning down around you. Instead, turn to him today. Turn to him right now. What we need to do on behalf of our own lives is cut down those idols that we go to to find satisfaction, to find fulfillment, to find blessing. Maybe you've been going to YouTube too much to find out how to live life and to be where you need to be. Instead, you need to be in prayer, seeking God's face and living life that he's blessed you with. Maybe you have done any number of foolish things like went uh, abandoned personal inner peace for the sake of a diagnosis from a doctor. You think that as long as that doctor gives you all clear, you're clear. Or he, you wait, and if you don't get a clear sign from the doctor, then you don't have peace of mind. Those, brothers and sisters, are idols. What I need you to do is to start cutting those things down. And if that means you go to less doctor's appointments and you trust God, then so be it. If it means that you unplug the cable TV from your house and you stop watching news and you're not in the know anymore, then so be it. Because the truth is, brothers and sisters, the reason we suffer, the reason we struggle, the reason we become oppressed is because God is disciplining us for our disobedience. We need to serve him, serve him alone, and serve him gladly. And I want to encourage each and every one of you to do that today. Not tomorrow, not when the world's burning down around you one day, but today. Turn to him today. He loves you today. The only thing he requires is that you give him your whole heart. In the New Testament, it tells us that the law of God is fulfilled in this commandment. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. I encourage each of every, and every one of you to do that today. Turn to God. Trust him with your future. Trust him with your finances. Trust him with your family. Trust him with your health. Trust him with everything. He is where all good comes from. You can trust him today. May God bless you as you live in this truth, as you turn back to him. May we see God raise up a deliverer for our people in the church everywhere over the earth. We pray that God would come quickly and bring his kingdom come. And I hope to see you, brothers and sisters, soon face to face if you're in Crawfordville. Come on down to Pioneer Baptist Church at 1030 on Sunday mornings or at 6 p.m. on Wednesday nights. Have a great week.